Well, how many of you are giving it a shot to memorize the Ten Commandments? A few of you? Can I see any hands there? <laughs> a couple. That's okay. I haven't really pushed that much at all. In fact, um, we do have little flyers out in the uh, fellowship hall. And it'd be kind of fun if I said, Diane Deering, what's the fourth commandment? She might know. She might know. The Sabbath. Very good. Hey, let's give Diane. Hey, that was pretty, pretty intense to come up with that one. I didn't give you number two. That might have been a little harder, but um, the Ten Commandments are worth remembering. And I think in our lives, it's going to be important to have times where we meditate on um, not just a little phrase to remember what it is, but to remember the gist of what these commandments are. Um, ten big ones given at Mount Sinai, precious words with timeless truths for us. And we are on number eight this morning, commandment number eight, which is, you shall not steal. You shall not steal. Now, after the fourth, yes, remember the Sabbath commandment, and then the fifth, honor your father and mother, we're on a little stretch where there are short, direct, and negatively presented commandments, things you're not supposed to do. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. We're going to continue next week. Uh, we, we got a couple more left. Uh, but they're, they're, we're kind of on the stretch where, where they're negatively stated. So as maybe a helpful companion to each one of these, I've tried to start presenting some positive uh, companions for them as well. And so for <clears throat> don't murder, I said feel free to back away from that cliff of murder and consider seeing life as precious. There's something behind it. Do not murder that the Lord is saying life is precious. And so we try to spend some time thinking about that. And then last week, uh, don't commit adultery. We talked about honoring covenantal loyalty, letting God determine our sexual ethic. And He's de determined that that is to be handled within a covenant relationship between a husband and a wife. And then taking that covenant relationship and seeing it as a reflection of our covenant relationship with Almighty God. And then today, don't steal. Well, what's the positive alternative for don't steal? Think about that just for a minute. You don't have to say it out loud. But if I said, what's the opposite of stealing? Of course, you'd say not stealing. But if you were to say, What's the positive opposite of stealing? What would you say? What? Giving? I said you didn't have to blurt it out, but you guys are doing really well. <laughs> Giving and then respecting other people's stuff? Absolutely. You guys are, well, I guess we don't, I'm going to come down. We don't need to even do this message for today. <coughs> All right, we will look at today three ways to obey. Number eight. Three ways to obey number eight, which is do not steal. All right. Well, let's just spend a minute imagining a world without stealing. Can you imagine a world without stealing? If nobody were to steal, how would your life be different? <laughs> Officer... Officer Rabata would be out of work. <laughs> hey, 180 can't hear all these, okay? So <clears throat> that's good. That's good. Think about the little things that you do because people steal. First of all, you lock your doors, right? We wouldn't have to lock our doors anymore. I mean, every time I get out of my car, I, I left my car uh, at the, the high school and went to a tournament, came back, and I was surprised. Whoa! I left my doors unlocked. What was I thinking? What do I have in here? Every time I stop with the kids, I don't have one of the little locks on my key. And so every time I get out, I have to wait for them to open their doors. So I, anybody else have to do that? So that I can push the lock button. So I don't know what's with my family, but sometimes I stop and I just sit and wait and wait <laughs> and wait. I'm like, would you please open your doors? And then I hit the lock button. Okay, why do I do that? 
because my car has been robbed, right? Had Dave Edwards bring back my, the contents of my wallet, uh, not my wallet, and Officer Edwards had found, uh, you know, what I had lost by, by theft. And then uh, I also locked my doors because I used to live in Minneapolis. And one day I didn't even know the car was gone. Got a call at four in the morning from Minneapolis police letting me know that it was time to come and pick up my car. Um, and so I locked my door. In Minneapolis, you lock your door so they can break your lock before they break your steering column and steal your car. Actually, they sometimes say, don't lock your door in Minneapolis. Just leave it unlocked, and uh, that'll be one less thing they'll break if they really want your car. Well, there would be a lot of things that would be different. There'd be no more usernames and passwords, right? Anybody else get irritated by all the usernames? Everything. You can't do anything on the internet without a username and a password. You need a password for this and for that, and I do some of my... Uh, keep track of my banking online, and, and every six months they want me to change my password. And, of course, all your passwords are supposed to be different passwords, right? Uh, so that you absolutely cannot remember them, and it's just such an irritating annoyance. Every six months they want me to change it for banking. You can't possibly remember all of your uh, passwords. Our lives would be more free and less inconvenienced. Our trust of others of strangers would be much higher, wouldn't it be? Prices would be lower. Who do you think pays for all the retail theft? We do, don't we? More than 10 million people have been caught shoplifting in the last five years in the United States. 10 million people caught. $42 billion was lost last year due to retail theft. One in 11 people shoplift. Do you shoplift? You, you laugh. You just take things when you're out and about. And they say they're only caught one in 48 times. Does that sound right, our law enforcement officers? Um, so a lot of theft takes place. Uh, yes, I had it written down. We could have less need for law enforcement, less need for all the video cameras. We're even getting video cameras here at Walnut Hill. Um, Less, there'd be less incarceration, less separated families. One of my first inmates I had in my Bible study down at the jail about nine years ago, he came in, and I asked everybody their name, and then I share my name, a little bit about me, and he shared his name, and I said, oh, I think I might know this guy, and then I shared my name, and oh, he thinks he might know me too. As a young boy, he was our paper boy. And he knew when we went on vacation. And I can't remember how he cut, the, he cut a hole in our door, didn't he? It was not a real efficient way to do it. Was it a saw or a drill? I don't know. Should have gotten the details. There was a hole in our door. And part of the reason I remember, I mean, it, you remember things like that. There's a little violation of personal property that you feel. Uh, but, of course, in my case, he went all the way up to my bedroom. And he found my piggy bank. He broke my piggy bank and made away with I had thousands of dollars. No, I did. I just, <laughs> it's a piggy bank. Are you that desperate for money? And it was pretty neat. He asked after a number of weeks, he said, do you mind if I share our story? A little bit about, <laughs> I don't know if he mentioned the piggy bank or not. I might have brought that up. Um, <laughs> But clearly, the whole episode did not serve him well in life. Thirty years later, he was back incarcerated. <clears throat> well, lest we once again question whether this commandment is for us, let me say that I believe there is an impulse within each one of us to take what is not ours, to acquire what we have not earned, to find reward where it isn't deserved. There are impulses of laziness and dishonesty and entitlement in all of us, and they are the impulses to steal. And it's worthy to be combated in the Big Ten. So, let's look at three positive statements, positive alternatives to stealing. 
The first one is to cultivate honesty. How do you, how do you obey the commandment not to steal? I would say the first one is to cultivate honesty. Honesty is kind of a stealing repellent. When we think of stealing, we think in the most blatant forms, which I've talked about, uh, by stealth or by violence. Maybe that doesn't seem like that's something either one of us would struggle with. But stealing can take place by stealth and violence and also, I would say, by mind games. We play mind games. There's heart deception, justifications that we make such that we don't feel guilty for taking what isn't ours. We're not honest with ourselves and wouldn't even believe maybe that we are stealing. Well, let's look just a little bit at what the Bible says, just what Diane Deering said there. Uh, The Bible describes honesty when it comes to personal property. The Bible recognizes the right and the innate goodness of private property. First of all, that's implied right within the command, isn't it? You shall not steal. That implies that something is mine that's not yours. And something is yours that's not mine. There's an awful lot of goofiness being talked about in some of our political discussions today, and people are even idealizing communism and the idea that everything is everybody's. Nobody even has private property. It's all owned by the collective or uh, different brands of socialism are going around where businesses are all uh, of a community. The the idea, you didn't build that. It's not yours is is an idea that, that personal property or your business is not necessarily your own work. Well, in Exodus 20, we get the Ten Commandments, but then in Exodus 22, Immediately, there are all these laws regarding personal property. It's really striking. I mean, this is, this is the Lord speaking to Moses directly, and there's all, there are all sorts of... I, I erased a number of them, but what happens if personal property is taken from one person uh, by another? If a man steals an ox or a sheep, there's, there's restitution that needs to be made. Five oxen, I don't know why... He has to repay five oxen for an ox and only four sheep for a sheep. I don't know why the five for oxen must have been a little more significant. Again, it talks about thieves breaking in and what happens if they break in and they die. Um, a stolen beast found alive in somebody's possession, how restitution is to be made. Um, if a man gives to his neighbor money or goods to be safe, so if you give your neighbor money uh, to be saved, what happens if, if it's taken? Same thing with uh, a donkey or an ox or a sheep or a beast, and, and you're giving it to someone to keep safe. When are they responsible and when are they not responsible for those items being lost? And then conversely, what if you ask to borrow something, even a higher level of responsibility? If you ask to borrow something, and then what kind of restitution must be made. All throughout the law, the Mosaic law, there are descriptions that relate to private property, and it's assumed that you have and rightfully own your possessions. So, the Eighth Commandment implies private property, The law legislates it, and then Jesus says something happens in us. The heart distorts it. The heart does funny things. He says, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. So so something happens from within side of us that distorts a lot of things, right? Jesus is saying there's something wrong inside of us that plays games, and it changes the way that we think. We have evil thoughts, and those evil thoughts might cause us to do things that we might not otherwise do. 
And he mentions murder and adultery, sexual immorality. And then he says theft. So there's something about private property and understanding this is mine. I have earned it. This is mine. And this is yours. You have earned that. There's something within the heart that blurs those distinctions. And you start to play games in your mind about what's yours and what's not yours. And I think as Christians, we can say, well, I sure am glad I'm not the guy that stole the money from your piggy bank. But how about all the different ways that we play mind games with theft? People don't typically just steal. First, there's something in the heart and the mind that takes place. (coughs) I can take from this store. They make a lot of money anyway. They charge too much. It's Walmart. It's a victimless crime, right? Who owns Walmart anyways? It's called retail theft, consumer theft. Well, I can fudge on my taxes. The government robs us anyways. It's called tax theft. Hey, I'm finding cool ways to download things from the Internet that I guess you're technically supposed to pray uh, play, pray for, maybe pray for, but you're definitely supposed to pay for. I wouldn't have bought them anyways. They're not out anything. It's a victimless crime. It's called internet theft, piracy. Hey, I don't have the money right now to pay them back. They should just leave me alone. It's debt theft. Hey, they never asked for it back, and I actually forgot it wasn't mine. Borrowing theft. I'll tell you, this week there were some convicting moments. I got a rower I need to return. (laughs) Mr. Deering, I almost did that yesterday. If I had more time, like, I got to get that back to him. (laughs) And then my little birthday girl, Claire, yesterday on her birthday. Oh, wait a minute. Somebody else has a birthday. Was it yesterday or today? Today is Grace, Grace Deering's birthday. I know, they're really close. Um, well, on her birthday, she wanted to come clean up my office. She's got a passion all of a sudden for cleaning up my office. So it looks even worse, of course, <laughs> after yesterday. But we're on our way. And while we're doing that, I, I'm getting rid of books. But guess what? Some of those books aren't my books to get rid of. And I look up in the cover and go, ooh. I found one that's, I think I borrowed about 25 years ago. And I need to return it to a friend in Minnesota. There's borrowing theft. You eventually just kind of forget or pretend to forget that it's not yours. Well, for most of us, when we are tempted to take what is not ours, we play mind games to make sense of our lack of judgment. Well, our, our lapse, excuse me, lapse of judgment. Um, this happened to me at a very early age for the first time. Um, I've shared this story with kids of this church at different times, and they always seem to remember and like to bring it up again. Um, but I remember when I was a little boy. I was pretty little. I don't know what age. But we were at the grocery store, and the reward for going with Mom to get groceries was what? You get a little treat. So I was told I could have a treat. I don't know if I've ever shared this with mom, maybe. Um, But I could have a treat. And so I grabbed a bag. Go ahead and I grabbed a bag and put M&Ms in my pocket. Now, only a little kid would, there, it's mine. It's in the pocket, right? And then we continue on. And at the end, it was decided that we each could have our treats. And so a second treat was presented to me. And as I reached for that treat, I remembered something. And I noticed something. The one in my pocket is unknown. Nobody knows it's there. Maybe nobody cares that it's there. And maybe somebody will end up with two treats. And so I took the second treat, and I experienced stealing. Maybe for the first time. I don't know. Maybe I had 
experienced this before. I remember coming home with this really strange mix of exhilaration and this other funny feeling. I'm sure I wouldn't have been able to express, but what was it? Guilt. I played mind tricks. I started thinking, oh, wait a minute. Does anybody even care? And in doing so, in that moment, I became a thief. Well, the way to combat the impulses for stealing is to cultivate honesty. Be honest. And the second thing I think we can do is to dignify work. To dignify work. I prefer to work for what I get. Are you that kind of person? I prefer to work. I want to earn my keep. I want to earn my reward. Of course, we know before the fall, Adam and Eve were made to work in the garden. Should be no surprise. Of course, the work was made harder through the fall, but they were (coughs) to have dominion and and care. They were to manage and oversee. That's work. Work isn't a bad thing, right? The fall didn't require us to work. The, The fall made work harder, and we shouldn't be surprised because we were made in the image of God. And God is a worker, right? Did he sit down on day one? He sat down on day seven. He worked. He created everything. The heavens and the earth were finished on the seventh day. God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. And this is part of the dignity of of what it means to be a human being, to work and to be rewarded for your work. Here, Jesus is described after His redemption in mankind in Hebrews chapter 11. He's described as sitting down at the right hand of the Father. And again, it wasn't for fatigue, but it's that sense of completion, reward, satisfaction. We talked about this with the fourth command as well. But this is something that should be in the impulses of mankind to, to sow and then to reap. It's so strong that in Second Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul, and everybody's waiting for the return of Jesus, and they're shutting things down. He's saying, don't stop. Keep living. Keep working. Hey, if you're not going to work, you shouldn't eat, right? I mean, there are times to get things for free. Grace is wonderful, but he wants us to work. It's part of the dignity of mankind. Uh, to work. We have a work as worship conference. Isn't it this Friday? Is anybody? It's this Friday, I believe. Yeah. It was wonderful this past <laughs> Friday. Was it really this last Friday? Oh, boy. Oh, there's Andy. Wow. I thought it was this Friday. I had that. I couldn't remember if it was Thursday or Friday, but I was sure it was last Friday. Okay. Last Friday. Can you agree, brother? Work is wonderful. It's meant to be designed by God. For It's part of who we are. To take that away from somebody is kind of a sad thing. You could just see sometimes with teenagers, it's a wonderful thing when they learn to work and to start to care about God's design that we, we have private property. Again, we're going to talk about what to do with that. It's not all about me, 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 right? But even that could be a wonderful thing for uh, people to, to learn to, to care and provide. I was born to, to workers, and a day's work was a wonderful thing, even if you weren't getting paid, just to be productive from beginning uh, to end. Well, that's the way we're created, the worker and the reward. We invest time, our energy, our expertise, we apply our creativity. We're each created so neat. Each one of you, I mean, I'm amazed at the things you can do. But carpentry, I, somebody was talking about that this week. Amazing, Patty. Amazing work. You know, it's just so wonderful. We're each made differently to, with our own creativity, with our own innovation, putting our time, energy, and expertise into it. And then we are able to reap a reward for our work. It's a wonderful thing. It's an awful thing to be a thief. So unsatisfying in the end. It ought to be 
miserable. When you steal, you make an injustice of work, and you take what someone else has earned. Isn't that the nature of cheating, too? The nature of cheating is I'm going to benefit off of somebody else's hard work. I don't want to do the hard work, but I want to reap the reward that somebody else has earned. 42 billion people, we said, or $42 billion was lost by business due to theft. Did you know only 37% of that was due to shoplifting? An even higher percentage was employee theft. The employees robbing their own businesses, either by embezzlement or by loafing around on company uh, time, needing to be watched, not working when you're not watched, calling in sick when you're not sick, taking perks that aren't offered. We steal when we're not good employees. And of course, the other side, management can rob their workers as well. Unfair wages, insufficient benefits, unsafe working conditions, oppressive, an oppressive work atmosphere, or unrealistic expectations. I mean, it can certainly go both ways. Management can take advantage of the workers, but it's never an excuse. Never an excuse for us to not dignify the work that God has given to us. Work is a gift. So we had a very unusual situation a um, matter of years ago. Uh, we had a situation where there was an individual that was very vulnerable. She was very old, and uh, she was needing to go into a nursing home. And we knew she was a hoarder. And so she revealed that she had money. Of course, not in the bank, right? She's kind of a paranoid hoarder. And she was hiding it in her house in different places. And so... Uh, we were responsible, we felt responsible to try to recoup this money that she said that she had around the house and make sure it went to the one to whom it was owed, the one who deserved to have that money. So how do you go and find money in a hoarder's house? It was a big challenge. I mean, we're talking real deal hoarder. So we found a worker. We found an honest worker, somebody who wouldn't be tempted to take what wasn't his. And we sent him in and said, here's the task. There's some cleaning to be done, but there's, there's money in this house too. And he found some money. You know how much money he found? A lot of money. I'm talking many several hundreds of thousands of dollars in that house. And that money was all taken together. We helped out um, this individual. We went down uh, to the bank, and they had a whole committee of people that were in there to make sure that human nature was kept in check. But you know who we wanted to go in? Somebody who was honest, and we wanted an honest worker, someone that wouldn't want to take advantage of the situation. And it didn't hurt that it was somebody right here from the church. They might actually be in this room right now, but I told them I wouldn't say who that was. Um, Christians are meant to be honest workers. Well, do not steal. <coughs> we cultivate, how do you battle that? <coughs> cultivate honesty, dignify work, and then we practice stewardship, Right? We practice stewardship. I think that's what's implied, again, by being fruitful and multiplying, filling the earth, subduing it, and having dominion. You're having dominion. You're having rule. There's management. There's stewardship over what we've been given. He's given the whole earth to us, and we are to be stewards of all that He's given. I think in stewardship, a good steward works. A good steward earns, right? And then they invest that. Now, some of it can be invested in the here and now. We need to live, right? We can invest in the future. 
We ought to invest in your children and future generations. It's a wonderful thing for a worker to earn their reward, invest themselves, invest in others. And part of that investment is sharing. Amen? Part of that investment is sharing. Being a good steward. Some of you said, what's the opposite of stealing, giving? Yeah, I think that's a big part of it, right? A big part of it is, is being a good steward of what God has given us. And that helps you respect other people's gifts, their blessing, their reward. Some people have pointed out, man, in Acts, there's an awful lot of sharing of possessions, right? And some people have actually said, boy, that looks a little like communism to me, which I don't think it is, but they all believed together. They had all things in common. They were even selling possessions and distributing to others as they had need, Acts 2. And then in Acts 4, very similar language. No one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Uh, there was not a needy person among them, for, the, uh, for as many as were owners of lands and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. I don't think it's, it, it sounds like it's saying they did, actually didn't own any possessions, which I know it, it kind of comes across as saying that, but what they're saying is nobody had a greedy spirit with their own stuff. Ananias and Sapphira sell land and give it. And what they're, they're uh, chided for is that they lied about the amount. Paul is going to have specific uh, things that he states to the rich. There still are going to be rich people in First Timothy chapter 6. And he encourages generosity, this spirit of seeing needs, caring about others, and helping meet their needs is going to kind of define the church there in Hebrews 13, 16. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. I mean, they have things, right? They have things, and they're sharing what they have. For such sacrifices are pleasing to God. What they had in that early church were open hands, loose fingers. They didn't say, this stuff is mine. They weren't worried about storing up treasures here on earth where moth and rust destroy and break. They they were sharing. They were giving from what they have. There's three ways to, I think, obey the eighth command not to steal. Cultivate honesty. Dignify work. (coughs) And practice stewardship. I said this week was uh, really one. I would say... It was maybe the most impacting for me of the Ten Commandments and really made me think in a number of areas of my life where I was cheating or or attempting to get away with something that God would not have for me to get away with or to seek a reward that I wasn't earning. Like I said, I found books that I wanted to return, a rower that I need to get back. I did make a little trip to a grocery store, too. I have to say it was awkward. My daughter wouldn't come in with me. I said, I want to go in, and I want to offer, not to toot my own horn or to look good, but I just said, I just want to be honest. We're studying the Ten Commandments at our church, and I took something from your store, and I, I don't know if it's even the same, you know, it's been changed, but it says since 1924, and I think that was the year, <laughs> if I remember. <laughs> I said, it was a long time ago, but I stole the bag of M&M's, and it wasn't right. I don't know how M&M's fit with sheep and oxen, but I gave him five bucks. And you should have seen the guy. I mean, he just did not have a category for what I was talking about. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't, again, not trying to be dramatic. I was just trying to be very straightforward. But he, I guess I looked like a little boy. He's like, well, it's okay. He was just like really nice to me. I'm like, no, I'm trying to do what's right here, and it's important, you know, I think, to make this right. Um, and then I said, would you just take it and maybe talk to somebody in management and see if there's a way to put that back into your business? And he said, I'll try. <laughs> I think he might have ended up with five bucks and 
have his own little commandment to you know, deal with. I don't know. Thinking about this commandment is a, a challenge because I spent a lot of this week thinking about reward. When you invest, when you work really hard, you're supposed to receive reward. And that just isn't true in this life a lot of times, is it? Some of you have invested really hard in your occupation and you've been passed over for promotion. Some of you have invested an awful lot in your children, thinking you're raising them up in the Lord and they walk away. I think we have to realize that things aren't as they ought to be in this lifetime. But we can do our part, right? We can do our part to try to bring righteousness. And, and I do think there, there will be a day where things will be made right. What a precious moment when you pass into glory and you receive that message. Well done, O good and faithful servant. Enter in to the joy of your master. I think the other thing that really struck me this week was not just sometimes we feel robbed by God. Life doesn't treat us well and we don't receive what, we don't get what we really have coming to us. But I think the other thing that was convicting was thinking about the fact that we're someone's investment, right? We're someone's creative work. Almighty God has invested a lot in us. A lot of time and energy and innovation and effort and creative. He's a creative master. And I wonder, sometimes are we robbing God? Are we giving Him the reward that He ought to receive? He doesn't ask us to be impressive, but He asks us to bear fruit. He's sowing, and He ought to be reaping through our lives. And when we live out our lives in a way that pleases Him and honors Him, I think that's one big way that we can honor the Eighth Commandment to not steal. Amen? Stand with me and let's close in prayer. <coughs> Lord, I hope that all this talk of work and earning and having wouldn't confuse us. You're a God of grace. We understand that. And so much of what we receive is undeserved and cannot be earned. And yet, Lord, we also want to recognize the wonderful place of, of work and effort and creativity and the image of God and our dominion over this earth. And Lord, I pray that we might be faithful stewards, that we might be fruit for you and, and fruit for others, a blessing to those with whom we come into contact in this world. Lord, this world desperately needs a ray of hope and words of peace and displays of righteousness. And God, you have placed us here to be your hands and your feet, to be stewards for you. We offer ourselves, Lord, to you for this purpose. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. And all God's people said,